So I'd just like to um, brief uh, overview, historical overview of the kind of stuff I've been talking about. And I think it's worthwhile noting that, say if we start with the idea of in vitro fertilization, which I wasn't talking about, but in vitro fertilization, the first child born by IVF in Britain, uh, Louise Joy Brown, who was born in 1978, she now has children. Um, that started a big part of this conversation because that's where these embryos come from. They get used in um, uh, embryon human embryonic stem cell uh, research. Responding to that sort of 10 years after this uh, in vitro fertilization thing began, the government of Canada set up a Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies. Then to up the ante in the conversation, I noted that the sheep dolly was cloned in 1996-97, and that shortly after, in 1998, we had the um, first production of human embryonic stem cells. In 2004, Canada passed its New Reproductive Technologies Act, so 15 years in the making. Um, we may blame government, but there was an awful lot of stuff happening in reproductive technologies. So it, um, it takes a while to get it right, to write laws that protect um, people from abuses, uh, but don't tie the hands of folks trying to, trying to help and do medicine. And then finally, in 2006, the um, what's called induced pluripotent stem cells to differentiate them from embryonic stem cells. So induced pluripotent stem cells in this whole new game, this whole new conversation that we now have about the possibility of stem cell therapy. So I'd like to say that um, because of these developments, we now find ourselves in a space where there's a need for creative and, and, and constructive dialogue. In particular, um, I'd like to note that because of the high, the really heated nature of the debate about embryonic stem cells, there is a lot of animosity between some of the fields that have been pushing for embryonic stem cells and others who have been saying, whoa, there's got to be a better way. And so I think first um, we have to get together. There needs to be some healing. And then we need to learn how to move forward together. OK, I'd like to switch gears briefly and look at this other project that I also think is, has changed the bioethical conversation for us. And I think it's even likely to change it in more profound ways than the stem cell conversation. In um, 2000, there's a, the slide here shows a picture of Bill Clinton with um, the leaders of the Human Genome Project from the um, private and the public sector. So there's a background story to the Human Genome Project about competition between private and public sector and questions about who owns the human genome, and that's for another day. But so there's a private and public sector thing here. It was a big enough announcement that in the United States it's made from the White House and in Britain, which was a, another one of the major collaborators in the Human Genome Project, it's made, Tony Blair makes it with some of the scientists in Britain, and there's this big uh, teleconference. So this was considered to be a big deal. The sign in the background there says, um, Milestones for Humanity. So this Human Genome Project, the deciphering, the first round of deciphering of the human genome was considered to be a very big deal. And just to bring the science religion conversation together again, um, Bill Clinton, in making his announcement, said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. And I think that's a good metaphor that he's chosen in the sense that it gives some idea of the impact that this information can have on our understanding of ourselves and possibilities for medical treatment. 
So this is just to remind me to say what a big deal it was and uh, how it really does change the playing field uh, for medicine in the future. Not quite yet right now, but in the future. Okay, we started out in the early 2000s with this human genome, which was sort of the average genome. It was the result of sequencing a large number of genomes, and then you put them together and corrected them and said, okay, um, this is the average one, because we all have variations in our genome. So there was this gold standard made um, that was announced as the human genome. It was very expensive millions to billions of dollars to sequence the human genome for one full round. It began in the late 80s and was completed you know, around 2003. So expensive and long. Within a few more years, uh, the technology that was developed in doing the genome project was such that having done it once, we can do it a second time a lot faster. So rather than keep with this average idea, they started to sequence the genomes of individuals. And you had to be a special individual to get sequenced first, but they mentioned Craig Venker here. He was the guy in charge of the private enterprise part of the human genome, so he sequenced his own, you know, he was involved. Um, and then the other one was James Watson. Uh, he was the other of the first two personal genomes that were sequenced. And he was involved in the original elucidation of the structure of the DNA that was celebrated in that 50th anniversary Time Magazine cover that I mentioned. So now, moving forward from this idea of having a gold standard general human genome, now we're starting to have this idea that you and I can have our genome sequenced. This is probably still way beyond the reach of most of us, but um, the cost is coming down. <laughs> so now that what we have then is human, this idea of human genetic variation as we get more genome sequence and of personal genomics. So the, these are all quotes that I take from, took from the journal Science, so it's sort of the way in which the scientific community is talking about these issues. So the, the possibility of discovering some uh, mundane things like red hair and freckles, or um, perhaps you're worried a little more about fudginess and a lot more about your cancer risk or your diabetes risk or your heart disease risk. So these are, this is a possible kind of information that the human genome sequencing of personal genomes can give you. And it points out here that it can be everything from exhilarating to, to terrifying to receive this new information. So I think this is another one of the things that we need to bring our understanding of who we are as human beings to. How do we receive this information, this new kind of information about who we are? 